Good morning, everybody. Thank you so much for being with us here this morning at Liberty Church Collingswood. It's great to see your smiling faces in the room. And online, let us worship the Lord that made us and loved us in Jesus Christ here this morning. If you're here in the room, you have everything that you need in your worship folder. We're going to be starting on page three with our first song. You also have it on the worship PDF that you can pull down from our website. And if you're able, I invite you, let's please stand and sing our first song. Good morning, Liberty Collingswood. My name is Anna, and I'm one of the liturgists here. I invite you to join me in a call and response on page four of your worship folder as we prepare our hearts for this time of worship this morning. I will bless the Lord at all times. His praise shall continually be in my mouth. O oh, magnify the Lord with me, and let us exalt his name together. O oh, taste and see that the Lord is good. Blessed is the one who takes refuge in him. O oh, fear the Lord, you his saints, for those who fear him have no lack. The eyes of the Lord are toward the righteous, and his ears toward their cry. When the righteous cry for help, the Lord hears and delivers them out of their troubles. The Lord is near to the brokenhearted and saves the crushed in spirit. The Lord redeems the life of his servants. None of those who take refuge in him will be condemned. The Lord be with you. And also with you. Let's pray. Gracious Lord, as we just sang, let us praise you in our service this morning and every day. 
We dedicate this time to you, and we ask that you would be close to each of us here, both online and in person. We ask that you would guide us to a place of deeper commitment and faithfulness to you. We praise you, Lord, and thank you for the gifts you have given us. In Jesus' precious name we pray. Amen. Let the king of my heart be the mountain where I run, the fountain I drink from, oh, he is my song. Let the king of my heart be the shepherd. Great. 
please be seated for the call to confession. The Christian Bible does not shy away from discussing brokenness or pain. Rather than denying, minimizing, or invalidating the heartache of sin, the Bible offers real, meaningful hope to those who are hurting. In confession, we can not only unburden our hearts, but we can pursue a life of freedom in Christ Jesus. I invite you to join me in praying the prayer of confession on page seven of your worship folder out loud, followed by a few moments of silent confession. Gracious God, our sins are too heavy to carry, too real to hide, and too deep to undo. Forgive what our lips tremble to name, what our hearts can no longer bear, and what has become for us a consuming fire of judgment. Set us free from a past that we cannot change. Open to us a future in which we can be changed and grant us grace to grow more and more in your likeness and image. Through Jesus Christ, the light of the world. Amen. Look up and hear these words of pardon from the book of Acts. Now when they heard this, they were cut to the heart and said to Peter and the rest of the apostles, brothers, what shall we do? And Peter said to them, repent and be baptized every one of you in the name of Jesus Christ for the forgiveness of your sins and you will receive the gift of the Holy Spirit. For the promise is for you and for your children and for all who are far off everyone whom the Lord God calls to himself. Now is time for a passing of the peace. I invite you to greet those around you and especially to say hello to someone you haven't met before, you haven't seen in a while. Liberty Kids can also be dismissed at this time. Liberty Kids three and four will be in the courtyard today so they can be dismissed outside and Liberty Kids two will be in their usual classroom up the stairs.
right, if we have never met before, my name is Eric. I'm one of the pastors here at Liberty Church Collinswood. Welcome once again. Thank you so much for being here on this Sunday morning and for choosing to worship with us. If you're a first-time visitor, I want to invite you to do something on the way out as you exit this morning. There's a stack of books uh, right outside this door that you came in. They're orange, The Prodigal God by Tim Keller. Those are free. So if this is your very first time, please take one. Uh, as you leave, simply as a gift uh, from us to you, no need to do anything in return. But also, and if you're tuning in online, I should say as well, there's also a digital form. We're happy to ship that to you wherever you are, so please fill that out also. Uh, if you're a regular uh, at our church or maybe a recent regular, a newcomer, and you've never taken a moment to fill out an info, John, there should be one in the pew right in front of you if you're here in person or online. You can find one on our website, libertycollinswood.org slash live. Let us know who you are. Fill that out for us. Put your name in your email at least so that we can reach out, say hi, answer questions, help connect you if you're interested in all of those things. But please take a moment to do that. There's also a prayer request line on there, uh, even if you are a newcomer or a regular attender. Uh, so feel free to fill that out as well. You can drop that in the offering plate or in the offering box, excuse me, by the front door uh, when you exit at the end of the service this morning. A few quick announcements. Uh, our next In Covenant class is coming up on June 5th and 12th. Uh, and so In Covenant class is simply an opportunity to get to know us a little bit deeper, to know a little bit more of where our church came from, what we believe, uh, what our goals are as a church, where we hope we're headed in the future by God's grace and all of those kind of good things. It's the first step also of the process if you're interested in becoming a member of our church, which we call uh, Coming In Covenant. And so if you're interested in that, come to that In Covenant class. It's free. Uh, child care is free. Lunch is free. Uh, two consecutive Sundays immediately following the service. You can't beat free food, free child care, so you might as well come if you've never come before. So please come to that. It'll be a good time. Uh, but sign up on our website, uh, or again, use that info, John, if you'd like, to let us know you're coming so we can have the right amount of food, all that kind of good stuff. But uh, please sign up for that coming up in just a couple of weeks. Uh, also wanted to let you know, and this is on page 18 of the worship folder as well, so summer is coming soon. Uh, it is the end of May, more or less, Memorial Day, just a week or so uh, away, which is hard to believe, but summer is upon us, and we are uh, beginning to put together plans for this summer. Some of you sitting in the room this morning know what some of those plans are because I have been sending out a flurry of emails over the last couple of weeks asking if you want to host various things. And so some of you know some of those plans, but we are uh, looking once again uh, to do our summer supper clubs, prayer gatherings, uh, planning on doing a Bible 101 class about how to study, how to read the Bible better, uh, a seminar to help us through like grief and things that we've experienced, loss that we've experienced throughout the pandemic. Um, we've also bought tickets to a Philadelphia Union game. Uh, it's going to be in July, so if you'd like to go to a Philadelphia Union game for cheaper than normal and sit with some other Liberty peeps, cheer on the Union, which you should because they're good. They're, they're at least still playing, unlike the 76ers, uh, whose season is over. So you might as well go and, hey, bud, I'm making it. You were going to make the same joke. Come on. Jeez. Unbelievable. Anyway, the union are great. Uh, yeah, I won't say more. Anyway, I'll be getting into the union. It's fun. But, um, but if you've never been, it's a really good time uh, at their, at their uh, stadium in Chester. So you can do that. But all those things are coming down the pike. So I just wanted to make you aware of that. You'll see more information in the coming weeks, things to sign up for, how to do that, how to be involved, how to be engaged. But wanted to put that out to you to let you know as our home meetings are all wrapping up our small groups, either this week or next week, all, all of our groups are, are con concluding for the year, uh, there's more on the horizon. So there will be ways to connect, to engage, uh, both just socially and also to engage with scripture, with prayer, and with one another. So wanted you to be aware of those things. So keep an eye out as we begin to announce those over the coming weeks. Uh, also wanted to let you know as well about a ministry that we're launching uh, also on June 5th called Liberty Bridge. If you're a parent of a fifth grader, you have or will shortly hear about this directly, I am sure. Uh, but Liberty Bridge is a ministry that we're launching for our fifth grade students to help them bridge the gap between Liberty Kids and Liberty Youth, between elementary school and, high, and uh, middle school, that is a, a challenging time, a challenging transition. 
Uh, and so we have this uh, ministry that's going to meet over the course of the summer after uh, Liberty Youth kind of shuts down for the year, and it'll be for our fifth graders to help them prepare for the fall, prepare to get into our youth ministry, prepare for middle school. It's going to be really great, really excited about it. Uh, Kelly Dalrymple, our Liberty Kids Director, has been working with Claire Smitley, uh, who is a parent of a fifth grader and also has been in our church teaching the Liberty Kids, and otherwise her husband Blake is an elder who's involved in Liberty Youth. And so those three and others are going to be able, I think, to do a really great great job with our fifth graders helping prepare them. So I wanted to let you know that on Sunday, June 5th specifically, there's a kickoff event at Golfland in Voorhees, 4 to 6 p.m. Uh, so please uh, register for that. If you're a parent of a fifth grader, family with a fifth grader, uh, sign up for that, come to that. It'll be a way to kick off that kind of summer programming. You'll hear more about it uh, from Kelly or others, but really excited to have that Liberty Bridge ministry. I think that's going to be important uh, for our kids as they become students in the years to come. So I want to let you know that. And that is it for me for announcements. So go to our website, make sure that you stay in touch with everything that's going on, sign up for the newsletter, follow us on all the socials, all that kind of good stuff. But Jim, come on up. Just like Eric said, my name is Jim Harden. I'm going to try being a preacher because obviously I can't play basketball anymore. We have a sermon coming your way. From Genesis chapter 8, verse 20, through chapter 9, verse 17. And as we're in the habit of doing, if you're able, I invite you to stand for the reading of God's word. And then we'll sit back down in a moment. We are now addressed by the living Lord through his living word. Then Noah built an altar to the Lord and took some of every clean animal and some of every clean bird and offered offerings on the altar. And when the Lord smelled the pleasing aroma, the Lord said in his heart, I will never again curse the ground because of man, for the intention of man's heart is evil from his youth. Neither will I ever again strike down every living creature as I have done. While the earth remains, seed time and harvest, cold and heat, summer and winter, day and night shall not cease. And God blessed Noah and his sons and said to them, Be fruitful and multiply and fill the earth. The fear of you and the dread of you shall be upon every beast of the earth and upon every bird of the heavens, upon everything that creeps on the ground and all the fish of the sea. Into your hand they are delivered. Every moving thing that lives shall be food for you. And as I gave you the green plants, I give you everything. But you shall not eat flesh with its life, that is, its blood. And for your lifeblood I will require a reckoning. From every beast I will require it, and from man. From his fellow man I will require a reckoning for the life of man. Whoever sheds the blood of man, by man shall his blood be shed. For God made man in his own image. If, and you, be fruitful and multiply, increase greatly on the earth and multiply in it. Then God said to Noah and to his sons with him, Behold, I establish my covenant with you and your offspring after you. And with every living creature that is with you, the birds, the livestock, and every beast of the earth with you, as many as came out of the ark, it is for every beast of the earth. I establish my covenant with you that never again shall all flesh be cut off by the waters of the flood, and never again shall there be a flood to destroy the earth. And God said, this is the sign of the covenant that I make between me and you and every living creature that is with you for all future generations. I have set my bow in the cloud, and it shall be a sign of the covenant between me and the earth. When I bring clouds over the earth and the bow is seen in the clouds, I will remember my covenant that is between me and you and every living creature of all flesh, and the water shall never again become a flood to destroy all flesh. When the bow is in the clouds, I will see it and remember the everlasting covenant between God and every living creature of all flesh that is on the earth. God said to Noah, this is the sign of the covenant that I have established between me and all flesh that is on the earth. Friends, this is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Let's take a moment to pray. Heavenly Father, thank you for gathering us in these spaces here this morning. Give us, O oh God, your Holy Spirit to illumine to us this word of God as we wrap up the flood narrative here at Liberty Collingswood. Thank you, O oh Lord, how we encounter the living Lord in this story and bring us forward from this story to the Lord Jesus, crucified and resurrected for us and for our salvation. Give us hope in him. Lord, some of us are coming full of faith this morning. Some of us full of doubt and skepticism. Some of us have had great weeks. Others of us have had really hard ones. 
Some of us feel like we're at the top of the world, others at the bottom. Lord, would you lift us up by your gracious and mighty hand. We pray even now by your Holy Spirit, in Jesus' name, amen. You may be seated. Here at Liberty Collingswood, one of the things that we'll talk about periodically is how stories shape our lives. Not just a little story you hear over there or a little story you hear over there, but uh, sometimes submerged in our minds and hearts, the baseline narratives that we tell ourselves, that we live by, that helps us to figure out what we do when experiences come our way, whether positive or negative. So it's kind of like this. Whether you think you're a winner or a loser, that affects how you think about things when things come your way. Whether you think I'm a good person or a bad person, that affects how you interpret things that happen to you. Whether you think, and not that we'd admit this to ourselves, but we should look in the mirror, I'm better than other people. That affects how we interpret our own realities. Or I'm worthless. I'm worse than other people. That affects. Or if our baseline narrative is things in my life are supposed to get better, or things in my life are supposed to get worse, or things for the world in general are supposed to get better, or things are supposed to get worse. And how we think about those things, how we interpret them, is based on that story, based on that narrative frame. And here at Liberty Collingswood, again, we like to ask the question that are big questions. What's the story of life? What is all of this from the little details to the little successes to the little frustrations to the giant sorrows to the huge hopes? What is all of this about? What's the story of humanity? About 10 years ago now, I read a book with a character that I think captures what Maybe many of us here in the West might feel about these things. The book, Jennifer Egan, A Visit from the Goon Squad. She's back in the news again, came out with a sequel to that book recently, The Candy House. But this is what one of these characters said, and it stayed with me. She, one of the characters, was writing a story of redemption, of fresh beginnings and second chances. Redemption, transformation, how she wanted these things. Every day, every minute, didn't everyone. Isn't that what we want? We want things to be better. We want redemption. We want transformation. We want restoration. Behind every success and every sorrow, we are longing for things to be different and better. That life can be transformed for the good. And on the surface, the character in the story, A Visit from the Goon Squad, that desire for redemption and transformation, that has a good bit in common with what the Bible says, the Christian story. The Christian story, whether you read the first page of the Bible or the last or any of the pages in between, it's a restoration story. It's a redemption story for all things from beginning to end. And it's previewed here in these verses. As the flood wraps up, as the waters recede, We see God's will for a good and flourishing world. And we're invited to enter in, to believe in Jesus and be a part of this story. But here's the rub. If you want to be part of God's story in Jesus, you've got to let God write the story. You can't be your own author. We're not good enough for that. But God is. And in the story of the scriptures, it's not just a redemption story, it's not just a restoration story, but it's a reckoning story, a reckoning with evil. And God has done something about that too. And that's a more difficult story sometimes. I think the character here in Visit from the Goon Squad, there's the longing for transformation, restoration, redemption, not as much of the reckoning part. But God's story here is harder but it's better. So let's talk in three parts from here 
about God's redemption story. Let's talk about restoration, then we're going to talk about a substitute story, then we're going to talk about a grace story. So three parts, restoration, and then substitute, and then grace. Like I said a moment ago, the flood waters are finally going down. If this is your first, first Sunday with us, either here in the room or online, we've been going through the book of Genesis. A lot of stories in the book of Genesis at the beginning related to the flood. Finally, we're back on dry land again, and this is the second chance for the world. The flood's destroyed everything, but here we go again. It's almost as if Noah and his family, like a second Adam and a second human family, repopulating, going out again. It's going to be great this time. And God is going to be more patient with evil as well. Verse 21 of Genesis 8. And when the Lord smelled the pleasing aroma, the Lord said in his heart, I will never again curse the ground because of man, for the intention of man's heart is evil from his youth. There's that reckoning with evil. We'll talk more about that. Neither will I ever again strike down every living creature as I have done. While the earth remains, seed time and harvest, cold and heat, summer and winter, day and night shall not cease. All of those rhythms are being reestablished again. And at least as I read the section of scripture that I read to you a moment ago when you were standing up, I see in this passage one of the ways to summarize it is that God is fiercely and ferociously for life. Let life teem once again. Let life flourish. We see God giving our first parents, our second first parents, Noah and his family and his wife, be fruitful and multiply. Verse 1, God blessed Noah and his sons and said to them, be fruitful and multiply and fill the earth. Or verse 7, again, and you be fruitful and multiply, increase greatly on the earth and multiply in it. Just like God told Adam and Eve way back in Genesis chapter 1. And God has said, now as well, I am going to sustain life anew. 9-2. The fear of you and the dread of you shall be upon every beast of the earth and upon every bird of the heavens, upon everything that creeps on the ground and all the fish of the sea. Into your hand they are delivered. Every moving thing that lives shall be food for you. And as I gave you the green plants, I give you everything. And God also said, I'm going to protect life too. But you shall not eat flesh with its life, that is its blood. And for your lifeblood, I will require a reckoning. From every beast, I will require it, and from man. From his fellow man, I will require a reckoning for the life of man. Whoever sheds the blood of man, by man shall his blood be shed, for God made man in his own image. There's a Bible scholar that said, reading about this passage, this is about life. Klaus Westermann is his name. Underlying the history of nature and the history of mankind is an unconditional divine yes, a divine yes to all life that cannot be shattered either by any catastrophes in the course of history, by the mistakes, corruption, or rebellion of people. God's promise remains rock certain as long as earth exists. And we wrestled a little bit, and I heard from some of you earlier on in the story of the flood, hey, the the flood's kind of hard because God destroys a lot of people and a lot of stuff. How do we wrap our minds around this? How is this God good? And I heard that Liberty Youth, you were asking some of these same questions. Wrestled with that some. I would only say here briefly that if you struggled with those things, I get it. Here we see God anew committed to the goodness and flourishing of life. This is a good God that is promising to preserve his creation once again. And in the history of humanity, all of the stories that we tell, life wins. That's the best. Last night with the family, I saw the new Marvel movie, Doctor Strange and the Multiverse of Madness. It was actually better than the reviews. The reviews were kind of mixed. I thought it was great. Some of the negative reviews were, this movie seems a little bit comic, little bit comic booky. And my response is, well, you realize that the source, but it was fine. It was was a great movie. And so I'm a Marvel guy, but one of my favorite comic books that I've ever read is a graphic novel from the mid-90s called Kingdom Come, written by a guy named Mark Wade, painted art all the way through by a guy named Alex Ross. And it's superheroes when they get older in the DC universe. And at one point, there's this disagreement between Superman and Batman, But there's this one human figure who happens to be a preacher that's trying to get Superman and Batman back on the same page. He says, Batman and Superman, you guys are not like each other in a lot of ways, 
but there's one thing that you have in common, and this is why you need to work it out and get back together to save the world. You don't want anyone to die. You don't want anyone to die. Superman for all of your light, Batman for all of your darkness. You don't want anyone to die. And so I would encourage you to be for life in similar ways. Whether it's your home or your workplace or your community, be for life. That's awesome. And it, it's a lot of little things that add up to more. If you live close to Collingswood, show up at our farmer's market in a small way. That's being for life. Sadler's Woods next door in Haddon Township. There was a cleanup day yesterday. If you're in Haddon Township, do that. Contribute. Whether in your home spaces or other spaces that you're in, add sunshine to the room. Be for life. Was it Charlie Brown? I forget the old cartoon when somebody's in a bad mood, when there's a little storm cloud over the person. It's like, oh, we got to avoid that person because that person's a storm cloud. Don't be the storm cloud person. Be the sunshine person. Don't be a pillow person. The pillow person is a type of person where you have to treat him, with her or him or her with a pillow all the time because, oh, we don't want to get him mad. Is this a good day or a bad day for this person? It's always kid gloves all the way down. Just be for life. And at a larger level, be somebody that cares about the vulnerable. Keep thinking about refugees all in our midst. How can we do more? Keep thinking about for the oppressed, people that are less advantaged than you are, people that have less money or resources than you do. Discriminated against, distressed, any way. What are you doing? And I'll tell you, and that this is a Bible passage that I've preached on a couple times before in my years of ministry, and this is the second time this sermon series that I've gone back to some old notes to see, hey, what did I do with this passage before? And this Be For Life section was one that I had written years and years ago. But admittedly, there's a couple contemporary headlines that, that, that ping my radar as I think about something like this. One is that we're grieving the shooting that occurred in Buffalo over this weekend an act of white supremacy against people of color, which is just wrong. That is something that we need to be against and say that is really, really wrong. And emotions are running really high again as it relates to abortion. I, I preached actually both on how the image of God means, in my opinion, as I read the scriptures, that we should be against racism and pro-life. That's October 10th if you want to go back and listen to that sermon. I was going to say more about the royal related to abortion again. I'm going to put that in the podcast this week. It was one of those things where people feel so strongly that if I say a little bit about it, I feel like I'd need to say a lot. But just wanted you to know that the Bible continues to speak to some really hard things that we need to continue to wrestle with. Meanwhile, be for life. Be for life. And I'll say, even though there are some areas of disagreement in different ways, I think whether you're from the north or south, east or west, right side of the political spectrum, left side, rich, poor, whatever it is, hopefully in a big picture way, we'll agree, religious or not religious, we should be for life. Life, good. Not life, not good. But if you're somebody who's still working through spiritual realities or might be skeptical towards some of these things, Thank you for being here and being in our midst to engage that direction just a little bit right now. Trace it back to the source. Life is good because God made it. And it's going somewhere. What we see here in Genesis 8 and 9, the world that God recreated is the same stinking, spinning rock that we are still on the same soil upon which we're walking, the same air that we're breathing, and it's the same heavens and earth that are going to be recreated when Jesus comes back, when life wins. The Apostle Peter says at the end of his second letter, but according to his promise, God's promise, we are waiting for a new heavens and a new earth in which righteousness dwells. That's where all of this is going. And if life wins, that's awesome. Be for life now. But if not, if all of this is meaningless and going nowhere, I think it's fair to ask the question, why are we bothering? Why are we putting so much effort into all of this stuff? 
making the rounds on the internet this week, article and interview in Vanity Fair, when the person interviewed is Kelly Williams Brown. Maybe you saw the article. She wrote the book on adulting, literally. About 10 years ago, she wrote a book called Adulting, when it's a young millennial person trying to figure out how to be an adult. She's written a couple of books since then. This article was catching up with her, and kind of the thing that she was talking about is, being a human being is actually harder than I thought when I, when I wrote the book 10 years ago. I've, I've had a lot of hard experiences. And she's somebody that, that I think is just a, a secular person. And in the article, in the interview, she talks about how it's really hard. If I think that all of this is ultimately meaningless and going nowhere, how to keep going in the present. And very revealing, this is what she said. I lie to myself. I'm just like, you know what? If I'm just a nihilist, what's the point of anything? Why wouldn't I just go out to the desert and curl up into a ball and dry out and die? And I'm not trying to pick at all on this author. In fact, I'm, I'm thankful for the honesty. But in a more general way, I appreciate how she's saying, for me to get through the day, get through my life, make meaning in a meaningless world, I'm just being honest here, I've got to make stuff up or else it doesn't make any sense. And I'll have plenty of conversations with skeptical friends of mine and I appreciate the dialogue where I'll be told, Jim, what you're believing in, all this God stuff, all this Bible stuff, totally irrational. I would say that critique is actually a two-way street. When Kelly Williams Brown here is saying, for me to say that I'm trying to live with purpose in my life, that is completely irrational. And that's why I need to lie to myself just to get through. And she, she, do, she, she does give some reasons. A couple of them, she says, well, life is really bad, but it's bad in new and different ways. And so there's at least some variety. And then also, if life is bad for me, maybe I can help when life is bad with other people. Th those are good reasons. And, and if they're, I'm not trashing them. But sooner or later, that undertow of meaningless comes back again. We can romanticize. Here we are just dancing on the edge of, of the abyss of meaninglessness. But that undertow is there. On the other hand, don't we think, everybody, it's good to be good. It's good to help people. It's good to be for life. And I would say, even if you're not somebody that believes in God or a follower of Jesus, that's the image of God in you and us barking saying, we should be for these things. And so that's the call to steward, to conserve human life, environment, to build wherever we are, life. What are you doing? What am I doing? So this is God's restoration story. We're called to be agents of God's restorative change in the world, to know God's restoration in our own life. That's part of what the story is. But it's also a substitution story. And this is where it gets interesting. Schol the one thing that scholars will ask, whether it's Jewish scholars or Christian scholars, when they go back to this passage, the one most quizzical or puzzling thing is right at the beginning in verse 20. First verse I read. Why is the first thing that, Abraham, that Noah rather does here, why is the first thing getting off the ark a sacrifice? Verse 20. Then Noah built an altar to the Lord and took some of every clean animal and some of every clean bird and offered burnt offerings on the altar. Why do you do that? What if it was you? If it was me getting off the ark after 150 days, my first thing would have been for me to say, I call the bathroom, right? But here we go. I'm going to make an altar and do sacrifices. And readers for millennia have said, why this? What's going on here? Well, this sacrifice, this is an offering of praise and thanksgiving to God. This is a prayer for continued blessing. All of those things are true, and we should bless God and ask that God would bless us and be thankful in our own lives. But as Genesis moves forward, there has been praise, there's been worship, there's been offering so far, but there's a couple of new details here. This is the first altar that we see in the Bible. Before this, nobody's made an altar so far. After this, everybody's going to make an altar. Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, and Moses, and the Levitical system of all that Old Testament law. All, if, if you have a thing for altars, there's a lot of altars in the Old Testament. 
This is the first. And the language here used for the sacrifice is very specifically that of burnt offering of an animal that is sacrificed. Now, we've had antecedents. Things have happened like this before. There was worship at the end of Genesis chapter 4. At that time, the author says, people began to call upon the name of the Lord. Cain offered some type of animal sacrifice, but it's here you have an altar plus more specific language that anticipates the very type of animal sacrifices and burnt offerings that priests would make in Israel. Leviticus a little bit later on, talks about an offering like this. The Lord called Moses and spoke to him, Speak to the people of Israel. When any of you brings an offering to the Lord, you shall bring your offering of livestock from the herd of the flock. If his offering is a burnt offering from the herd, he shall offer a male without blemish. He shall bring it to the entrance of the tent of meeting that it may be accepted before the Lord. He shall lay his hand on the head of the burnt offering, and it shall be accepted for him to make atonement for him. The purpose of these offerings, and this is a big Bible word, atonement, sacrifice and forgiveness. God, accept this blood instead of this blood. Accept this life instead of this life. And so what Noah is offering here is a substitute sacrifice. God, accept this blood, this life, so that we, this blood and this life, can live. In verses 5 and 6 of Genesis chapter 9, I read earlier, where God requires life for life, blood for blood. Earlier on in this passage, when that altar is built and the burnt offering is made, that's this principle already in action. There must be not only redemption and restoration, but for redemption and restoration to occur, there also must be a reckoning for evil. And this is what changes God's attitude towards everything. And I'll put changes God's attitude in quotation marks. And this is deep mystery here. God is sovereign. God is timeless. He's in control of all things. God's never caught by surprise or things that happen in the world that God doesn't ordain. Deep mysteries and all of that. But as a timeless God interacts in time with people, look at what happens in verses 20 and 21. Noah built the altar. That's verse 20. And when the Lord smelled, verse 21, the pleasing aroma, when God receives the offering, that's when he says, I will never again curse the ground because of man, for the intention of man's heart is evil from his youth. And if we have Adam and Eve as our first parents, Noah as our second Adam, we remember the last Adam, where if Noah if Abraham, if Isaac, if Jacob, if Moses, if Aaron, if all of those priests made sacrifices, including burnt offerings to God, outside of their bodies, Jesus, our high priest for all time, offered a sacrifice not outside of his body, but of his body. In the New Testament, in the book of Hebrews, we read, every priest stands daily at his service, offering repeatedly the same sacrifices, which can never take away sins. But when Christ had offered for all time a single sacrifice for sins, he sat down at the right hand of God, waiting from that time until his enemies should be made a footstool for his feet. For by a single offering, he has perfected for all time all those who are being sanctified. Marvel. We talked about Moon Knight a couple of weeks ago, where he said at one point, the character, not broken, I just need a little help. Sometimes that's true. But then the Bible goes beyond that. Like Anna was saying earlier, the Bible is very honest about our pain and our sin. Sometimes it's not just that we're a little broken. We're very broken. We're completely broken. And we need God's help. And that's good news because we have our own mess, right? Sometimes it's not just everybody else's fault, but sometimes it's ours too. Sometimes my stories aren't all that great. And I need to own up to that. And when it's all everybody else's fault, maybe in that case, it's easier to say, I need help. But sometimes the problem with my story is me. What do I do then? That's when I need atonement. That's when I need forgiveness. For everybody listening, you need forgiven. I don't mean to be nasty or mean-spirited when I say that. 
But that's just being honest about our own mess and honest about our own junk. And you might say, I don't need a sacrifice. Like, I don't need atonement. I don't need forgiveness. Over 100 years ago, when scholarship started to go around the world and anthropology was a new field, one of the really interesting things that people started to discover, and, and the West Christian theologians started to process this too, they realized, wait a second, in every culture, ancient culture around the world, what are people doing? They're offering sacrifices to the divinity, to God. Again, whether north or south or east or west, there's a quote by a Dutch theologian in your reflections folder by Herman Bobbing that says that's that very thing. We are born with this sense that we've got, that we are born related to God. And why is it that all around the world, cultures that have never spoken to each other are saying, I don't know about you, but I feel like we better make an altar and start sacrificing to God because the guilt sticks. And in my opinion, this is why the good news of Jesus is hard. And the Apostle Paul says that there is an offense woven into the gospel. And it's the cross. You see, sociocultural issues, they'll come and go. And those things are always going to be offensive in different periods and in different ways. We don't try to be offensive. We don't go out of our way to be offensive. Just try to be faithful to scriptures, the whole third-way walk and worldview thing. But the core of it is not this sociopolitical issue or this cultural issue. The core of the offense of the Christian story is that it comes to us and says, you need forgiven or else we're still in our sins. And that is really hard. And again, if we're skeptical of that idea, isn't this why we work so hard so much on self-atonement in a lot of different ways? Even the phrase that's current, you got to put in the work. From a certain perspective, that's self-atonement. And I'm not saying that putting in the work is bad. Putting in the work is good. We put in the work when it comes to our bodies. We put in the work when it comes to our relationships. We put in the work when it comes to our education. We put in the work when it comes to morality. And the racism reckoning that we've had over the past couple of years, it's a phrase that people used, and I use it too, putting in the work to, to wrap our minds around racism in our country. We'll put in the work as it relates to our own performance and getting the job that we need and the, the life that we need. But if that's all it is at that level, we're trying to work off, work off, work off, work off, work up, work up, work up, work up. And it's exhausting. And if that's all it is again, if we hit our targets, we're going to feel like we're better and superior than other people. Or if we don't, we're going to be shattered. And how would you know if you're putting in enough work? Or is it just more and more and more and more and more? Tradition has it that when the Buddha was dying, his last words were, never stop striving. If I was an original disciple of his, that would have been a bummer. And not to pick on Buddhism specifically, but Jesus' last words are, it is finished. The work has been done. We need a substitute. And it's by grace. This is a grace story. And this is where we'll wrap, wrap up the rainbow here in this story. God has promised by his covenant, I'm not going to destroy the world by flood again. Verse 8 and 9 of chapter 9. Then God said to Noah and his sons with him, Behold, I will establish my covenant with you and your offspring after you. And then we have the part about the rainbow. And with every living creature that is with you. Verse 11, I establish my covenant with you that never again shall all flesh be cut off by the waters of the flood. Never again shall there be a flood to destroy the earth. And God said, verse 12, this is a sign of the covenant that I make between me and you and every living creature that is with you for all future generations. I have set my bow in the cloud and it shall be a sign of the covenant between me and the earth. When I bring clouds over the earth and the bow is seen in the clouds, I will remember my covenant that is between me and you and every living creature of all flesh. And the waters shall never again become a flood to destroy all flesh. And this rainbow, in English, we have different words for rainbow that's in the sky and the bow is in bow and arrow, like Hawkeye or green arrow or red arrow or arsenal 
and other comic book heroes that shoot bows and arrows. So we have bow, that's for the bow, and then rainbow for the thing in the sky. In the original language here in Hebrew, same word for both. There's only one word, which is fine. And Jewish and Christian commentators for generations have said, this is an intentional play on a word. Where rainbow in the sky, we know what that is. But then also there's this bow that's pointing up, a symbol of war. And so now there's peace. There will not be war by flood upon the earth anymore. But that bow pointed up has made people think like this. Charles Spurgeon, preacher in London last century, or in the 19th century, faith always sees the bow of covenant promise. He was talking about this passage. Whenever sense sees the cloud of affliction, God has a bow with which he might shoot out his arrows of destruction, but see it's turned upward. In this covenant sign, God is saying, when sin gets too much again, I will self-afflict. I will take the hit. The war of wrath upon sin will come upon my son. And that's why Jesus died on the cross for our sins and for yours. God took the hit for us. And so the substitution that we need is a gracious one through and through because Jesus paid that penalty for us to open the door not only to forgiveness but for all of the redemption and all of the restoration and all of the transformation that we see in this passage and all over the Bible as well. And this is meant to transform. It transforms our community. So it's not about us. It's about Jesus through and through. This transforms our mission. So we're not saying, hey, you should think about following Jesus so you should be good like me. Instead, it's we're a bunch of people that have a ton of issues and are messed up in a lot of different ways. We're trying to help each other and love each other well. We are broken and we need help. Come join us as we receive grace because we all need it. That's the equalizer that we need. And let it transform you. Whether you need some hope and restoration this morning, whether you need some transformation, whether you need some forgiveness, whether you need life, it's here for you in Jesus. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Please go ahead now and turn the worship folder on the PAF to page 11, where we have the Apostles' Creed. This has been said in the church around the world for many generations. And if you're able, once again, I invite you, please stand. And in the words of this creed, let us say what we believe. I believe in God the Father Almighty, the creator of heaven and earth, and in Jesus Christ, his only Son, our Lord, who is conceived of the Holy Spirit, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, died, and was buried. He descended into hell. The third day he arose again from the dead. He ascended into heaven and sits at the right hand of God the Father Almighty, whence he shall come to judge the living and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Catholic Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and life everlasting. Amen. You may be seated, and I invite forward the Mitchells and a couple others now. is running and getting Olivia so that we can have a complete contingent of Mitchells here this morning. So Eric is our executive pastor. You heard from him earlier in the service. He is going on a well-deserved 12-week sabbatical starting at the end of this coming week. Sabbaticals are extended breaks and rests that we have built into our pastoral schedule here at Liberty Church Collingswood. It's one of our practices of presence, right? We work hard, and then also we take Sabbath rest in appropriate ways as well. And so, Eric is taking his first ever sabbatical. He and Carrie came here pre-children way back in 2014, and 
There are some ways in which you recognize this, other ways in which you have no idea, but there would be no Liberty Collingswood without the Mitchell family. So Eric came here. His, his initial, it's not like he makes millions of dollars now, but his uh, initial salary from Liberty Collingswood when he came here, Eric, do you remember how much we kicked in per year for you? <laughs> Two smackers. $2,000. And said, Eric, we'd love it if you could uproot your family from a place where you and Carrie both grew up, and we're so excited about you coming that we'll pay you $2,000 a year <laughs> to, to, to be a part of what we're doing. And so Carrie was working, and Eric, for a first number of years, worked part-time at church as a pastoral resident and worked at Groove Ground Coffee Shop just a few blocks away from here on Haddon Avenue, and what Eric did over a period of time was make himself indispensable. And as we had lean budget years with church that started in my living room, and the, we did, didn't have a ton of people, didn't have a ton of money, but we just said we've got to make it work to keep the Mitchells here year after year after year. And Eric has gone from a part-time resident to full-time and now ordained minister of word and sacrament Eric and Carrie and your family, I love you so much. Thank you for all of the sacrifices that you've made for a number of years, almost a decade here at Liberty Collingswood. This church is here because of your love and your grace and your labors in our midst. And we are thrilled to be able to pray the Mitchells out and back to Liberty Collingswood in three months. So we also have Jesse and Maya as representatives of our consistory and people that love the Mitchells a lot well who are going to begin to pray. We'll pray in three parts. I should have mentioned Jesse and Megan. Let's try to do the Lord in your mercy hear our prayer. Oh gosh. I said Maya the first time though, didn't I? Okay, sorry. So Jesse and Maya, if you could please uh, do the Lord in your mercy, hear our prayer that, that we'll respond with, and Jesse is going to kick us off. Let's pray. Well, Father in heaven, as, as Jim just stated, we marvel, Lord, at the, um, the ministry and the work that um, not just Eric has, has put into the life of our church, but Carrie as well. And, um, but Lord, we... We thank you in particular for, um, for their, um, for the sacrifices that they made to come here and, and be part of a tiny church plant in South Jersey um, in less than the first year of its existence. And, and Lord, there was no, never a guarantee that um, you would have made this church flourish. Um, we were dependent on your Holy Spirit. And Lord, I thank you for their faith, um, this faith that they have had in you. Uh, to establish this church. And Lord, as, um, as Eric comes to this uh, season, his life and his ministry, Lord, I pray that you would bless him um, and Carrie and uh, their daughters, Olivia and Madison, with uh, true rest. Uh, Lord, would this rest be uh, restorative and life-giving um, for Eric and Carrie. And, and Lord, for, for Eric, I pray that uh, the rest would not only be... Um, relaxing um, and fun. I indeed pray for those things, but it would be um, a time for him to rest his soul in you, that he would recognize you, Lord Jesus, as the author and finisher of his faith and his work here. Lord, you are the one who establishes um, our ministry here. And would um, Eric rest knowing that um, you're, you're going, to, going to continue to lead our church while he is away. Um, and Lord, would um, you bless their travels and their trips um, up in Cape Cod, down in the Outer Banks and the trips that they're planning to have together as a family, would it be um, a truly restorative time uh, for all of them, that they would enjoy one another, um, enjoy their time together, um, that um, you would help them, help Eric to daily just let go of whatever anxieties um, he may have or they may have um, over the work um, that has been trusted to him and would um, would you continue to provide that uh, for him and, and Lord we pray um, that this would be um, they would equip them for to take on the work again a few months from now but Lord for now we pray for for deep and true and joyful rest for them Lord in your mercy 
Lord, we pray for this time of sabbatical will be a time where Eric can refocus and renew his heart for the church and for doing your will here on earth. We pray that you will help him find a new day-to-day routine for the next three months and to use his time wisely to engage in a purposeful rest. We pray for safe travels as he, carrying the girls, go on various trips to see family and explore your beautiful creation. We pray that he will be able to connect with old and new friends and invest in those relationships that may have taken a backseat as he has poured his energy into liberty. And finally, we pray that throughout this whole sabbatical, Eric will dive into your word and crave to learn more about the truth that is found there. May he draw closer to you and seek your wisdom and counsel in every aspect of his life. Lord, in your mercy. The sabbatical for the Mitchells rounds through these 12 weeks that you would be with them to re-engage and to give your Holy Spirit not only to Eric but also to carry, to think through what lies ahead in their next seasons of life and ministry as Eric won't spend the whole time as on purpose he will spend time thinking, reading, and reflecting on things that don't have anything to do with ministry in the church as, he sh- as that's good to disconnect, but then as he begins to read and pray and reflect and go through guided life coaching for a minister, think through leadership, think through theology, think through culture, think through aspects of church work directly related to his job and roles, but then also otherwise too. Father, would the re-engagement period be one of joy and energy for Eric and for the Mitchell family? Father, one of, the, one of the ways that sabbaticals can go haywire is that the end of sabbatical can be met with a rude awakening on the other end of coming back from time away. Lord, I pray that even though there will probably be some, some registering of being back in the swimming pool, after being away, Lord, help Eric to swim well and widely and deeply and energetically once he returns on the basis of how you have given him rest and recalibration and have walked with him so that he can be ready to re-engage. Father, thank you for this family whom we love so much. We commend them to your grace and mercy and their continued flourishing. Father, would you cause your face to shine upon them over these 12 plus weeks. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. Let's have a round of applause for these fine folks. All right, thank you everybody. So now, thank you for your giving to Liberty Church Collingswood, and just to say you can give online, there's also an offering box in the back of the church, you're giving to us, let's us give to other people. And one of the things that we love to be able to do is give to other church plants. And just want to highlight for you one of the church plants that we give to. It's Liberty Church in the Northeast. How many of you have been to the Northeast section of Philadelphia? It is a time warp kind of place. So Northeast Philly is a place where, and Evan Curry, the lead pastor there, would, would say this, not a lot of people want to live there. In, in Northeast Philly. There's a lot of younger people there that are saying, hey, I've got to get out of this weird, landlocked piece of Northeast, Phil- Northeast Philadelphia. It's traditionally a, a white working class neighborhood, but now there is a lot of opioid stuff and, and a lot of poverty. And so it, it's, people don't move to Philly and say, I'd love to go into the Northeast. But Jesus loves everybody and says the gospel needs to be here as well. So thank you for your giving to Liberty Collingswood. So we're able to pay it forward there just a couple years post-launch. Why don't you try launching a church in pandemic? It's kind of tough, but Evan and, and his team, they're doing a great job. They celebrated their Easter service a few weeks ago. They were praying, Lord, for the first time ever, could we have over 100 people in the room? God gave them that and more. They had an Easter egg hunt for the community in the Northeast where they are the day before. They had like 400 people come from, from the Mayfair section of, of the Northeast. 
Evan has a church planting resident named Kyle who's looking to plant another church somewhere else in the north. The northeast goes on forever. And they also were able to hire at about 10 hours a week another pastor to give pastoral care. So I, as part of the Liberty Network lead team, am Evan's coach. So we sit down once a month and Evan tells me how things are going. It's, it's a privilege for me to have a front row seat. Thank you for your giving to our church. And let's continue to pray for Liberty Church Northeast. Now, thank you for joining us. In particular, if you've been on, online, this is where we leave you. We're going to have the Lord's Supper here in just a moment here in the sanctuary. But let's receive God's good word of sending his benediction. May the grace of the Lord Jesus Christ and the love of God and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit be with you all now and forevermore. Go in peace. Amen.